But I know one thing about myself. I struggle a lot. I struggle sometimes because of the wrong choices I make. Sometimes I struggle not because of what I make. I don't know about you, but at times I am discouraged. At times I ask myself, if Christ was to come today, will I make it to heaven? But I've, I've concluded one thing. If I look at myself, there's no way I will be in heaven. But if I lean on Christ, there's nothing that can prevent me from being in heaven. I don't know about you. Maybe you are ready for translation. <laughs> it may not apply to you. That is why I've concluded, thank you, sir. I've concluded this. My struggle continues, but in Christ, my victory is certain. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we briefly go through your word, speak to us. Challenge us, but comfort us. In Jesus' name, amen. Every human being, every single human being, including you and me, everybody is in search for significance. Do you know this man? You don't know him. Let me give you his name. Danny Meyer. Do you know him? If you are in New York, from New York, maybe you know him. He's the CEO of... Uh, the Union Square Hospitality Group. He's, he owns several restaurants here in the U.S. Yesterday, I tried to count the number of restaurants he has. I could not. Then I stopped. But let me give you some of the uh, famous ones that he owns. Grand Merci. Have you ever eaten at Shake Shack, what's ever eaten there? People queue for two hours to get a burger at Shake Shack. There's no drive-through, you have to queue. And people queue for two hours. Do you like queuing for food? But they have interviewed people, they say that it is worth it. It's very successful. He created his first restaurant in New York when he was 27 in 1985. Very successful. And the secret of his success, he had an interview with uh, Anderson Cooper last week that I watched. The secret of his success is customer satisfaction. And the means he uses is to fill every customer important. In his interview, he said something that attracted my attention. He said that if you see every human being, including you and me, he said that each of us is walking around carrying a sign that reads, please make me feel important. Does it apply to you? We all feel important. But some people have taken it too far. Their search for significance. Look at this picture. I'm really praying for God to bless me so that we upgrade our, our system. You see this beautiful man here? He was not satisfied, satisfied with what he looked like. He decided to look like this. Have you heard about him? Dennis Havner. And finally, he was not still satisfied with uh, looking like a cat. He decided to kill himself. After, before he, he died, it is recorded that he spent about 200,000 US dollars 
in rebranding himself. It did not start here. It started in heaven. When you read Isaiah 14, there's something important that we see there. Lucifer was not satisfied with who he was. The Bible said that he, after the Trinity, he was the one, the next in command. Then he decided that that was not okay, and his strategy was to find some, a way of being above God. And Isaiah 14 verse 12 said, because of that, he fell. He fell because of a wrong search for significance in position. Do you feel that it is when you are in position that you make it in life? Let me tell you, Frank, if you rely only on position to feel significance, you are miserable. When I was growing up, my dad was considered a who is who in our community because he was a power broker. But in 1995, when he retired, all of us became nobodies because he was no more a power broker. If you think that it is insignificant that you will find in position that you will find your significance, you cannot hold those positions for eternity. It did not stop there. When Lucifer became Satan, he was thrown out of heaven, he came on earth. And he came to the beautiful garden of Eden where he met Adam and Eve and he told them, hey, do you really, why are you not eating from this fruit? They told him, God told us not to eat because the day we eat from it, we will die. He said, no, God is misleading you. You will not die. If you eat out of it, you will become like him. Something is in that text that I don't understand. The, the text says, suddenly, when Satan said that to Eve, Eve saw in the fruit something pleasing to the eye, something that can elevate her. And they ate of it. What happened? Did they become like God? They became naked. God does not use fig leaves to hide his nakedness. They were not only trying to find significance in becoming like God, but they were looking for significance through food. Do we sometimes try to find significance through food? It did not stop in the Garden of Eden. The search for significance is still going wrong today in our world. We call it the great controversy or the conflict between good and bad. And no human being is immune to it. Every one of us. When I was reading my Bible, when I became Adventist for the first time, I thought I was the one really struggling until I read this text, Romans 7, from verse 18, Paul, the Apostle Paul, that wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament, he saying, I want to do good, but I find myself doing what is bad. Does it happen to you? You really want to do what is good, but you see yourself doing what is bad. And he came to a conclusion. He said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he said that it happens to us because we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We are fighting against principalities. What does it mean? It means that if my good friend, Pastor Moran, is mean to me, I should not focus on him. I should focus on what is behind the great controversy. And we see that in the life of Jesus. When Peter wanted to prevent him from fulfilling his mission, he said to him, get behind me, Satan. He was not calling Peter 
Satan, but he was telling Peter that he is allowing Satan to use him. Sometimes we let also the devil use us. How does the conflict between good and bad manifest itself today? If you follow the news carefully, you have read or heard on March 24, 2015, a young German pilot was flying between Barcelona and Germany. When the captain left the cockpit and went to ease himself, the young pilot locked himself. Before that, he told his girlfriend, I will do something that the world will always remember me. Then he locked the cockpit. The captain could not enter the control room and the young pilot zoomed into a mountain and killed 150 people because he wanted to be remembered. We have been reminded of that a few weeks ago, October 1, 2017, in Las Vegas, where a shooter, they don't yet know what led him, but he killed 59 people. If you have watched 60 Minutes on CNN, you realize that if the police were not quick, maybe hundreds of people would have been killed there because it was like a military barrack, his hotel room. That is what evil, the, the battle between good and evil look like. But what about us? The people that are so proud that they are part of the remnant, what about us? What about the way we treat each other at home? At work? Even at church? Is it not the battle between good and evil? Are we not allowing Satan? Let me share a personal experience. Something happened, we're attending this church, something happened, I, I don't know why, but we were not able to come to this church for about four weeks. We had no phone call for, from anyone at all. And after four weeks, we came. When we came, I was about to sit down, someone came and said, oh, I, I thought you, you left the church and the person was happy that I was no more coming. I said, oh, is it what you mean? I bent down to take my Bible. I wanted to walk out. Sister Charity came. He said, oh, I praise God that you are here today. The good one that day. And I stayed till that day I'm here. But I've learned a lesson. I should not have even tried to leave when that other person was happy that I was no more coming to this church because she was allowing the devil to use her to discourage me. It is happening. It's not far from us. It is within us. What about the deliberate choices we make? Sometimes we fail even to return faithful tithe because we want to buy the latest shoes on the market. It is the conflict between good and evil. I want to bring it really down to our level. Do we go on time to work? Do we come on time to church? Do we feel strong from Sunday to Friday? And do we feel weak every Saturday morning? It is the conflict. Because the devil keeps on telling us, hey, God will understand. Don't worry. Don't worry. They say 10, but you know all nations, everybody comes at 10.30. It is not everybody that is my time. It is the set time that is my time because I have given a rendezvous with my God. What about ethnocentrism, tribalism, 
or racism. Whenever you feel superior to someone because of your culture, because of the color of your skin, you are in the camp of the devil. Do you know why I'm saying that? We believe that all of us have been created in the image of God. Two of us. If you, if Diana is created in the image of God and I am created in the image of God, there's no way Diana should think to, to put me down because of my race. There's no reason for me to try to put her down because of her race. If I believe that Jesus did not come to die only for one color, and every color according to Revelation will be in heaven, I better be careful to play in the camp of God. Because if I want to be a good citizen of heaven and a good neighbor to you in heaven, I better learn to be a good neighbor to you on earth. And not allow Satan to be a winner in that battle. Is there hope for me? Is there hope for you? Oh yes, there's hope. Do you know why? Because Jesus died for us. And John 19, uh, 20, uh, 30 is really fantastic. When Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, before he died, he said one word, a couple of words, it is finished. It is finished means that there is hope for you and me. It is finished because the victory in that battle was won by him. It is finished. And before he said it is finished, a couple of hours before he told his disciples this way, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It is only because of that victory that Jesus won that there's hope for me and there's hope for you. Jesus is saying, hold on. Hold on a little while. Don't give up. Keep going. Hold on. The struggle continues, but victory is certain. You know, I, I shared with you the struggle of the Apostle Paul. He was saying that, I want to do good, but I cannot. I find myself doing what is bad. And I like this one. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What Paul was saying here in Jesus we have the assurance of victory. We have the assurance of salvation. The great controversy, if we read in the Bible and the writing of Ellen White, we discover that toward the end of the age, it will be intense. But no matter the intensity in Jesus, my victory is certain. No matter the intensity in Jesus, your victory is certain. Don't quit. Hold on. Don't quit. Hold on. And uh, Paul is saying to the Ephesians here, not that I've already attained or gained the victory, but one thing I do, I stop looking back. I press forward. That is really important. Sometimes we don't get to, to taste the victory Jesus is giving us because we are still prisoners of our past. By the way, there's no one here that does not have a past. I pray that Jesus does not do that miracle right now. To start flashing the past of every one of us, the church will be empty. Because all of us have a stain in the past. But you know what? Paul is telling us 
that the secret is to let Jesus free you from the baggage of your past. And the Bible says a promise somewhere that God, when he forgives our sins, when we confess them, he ties them to a big stone and he throws them beneath the sea. No wave can bring them up. This is one other manifestation of the great controversy. Satan does his best for you to remain prisoner of your past. I was preaching somewhere for a public evangelistic uh, campaign. One day, one night, I, I stood up to preach. I look behind, I saw a, a young man there of my age. He looked at me, you know, when you look at someone, the person is looking at you, you know. I looked at him, he nodded his, his head this way. I knew what he was, he was saying. Basically, because we went to high school together, he knew me inside out. He was telling by this sign, who do you think you are? You think I don't know? When I stood up, I changed the verse I was going to preach on. In my introduction, I quoted 2 Corinthians. In Christ, we are new creatures. I'm not creature of my past. I'm a new creature. Don't let the devil get you prisoner of your past. When I finished preaching, I was shaking the hand of uh, people that came. He came, he shook my hand. He said, I believe you. I said, praise God. Amen. Believe you, praise God. You know, victory is found in holding on to Jesus Christ in the midst of our struggles. Don't quit. It can be rough, but don't quit. Paul is telling us something inter interesting here. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the, the faith. Paul is telling us he was not just sitting to get the victory. He held on on Jesus Christ. Held on on Jesus Christ. I love the Bible because the Bible does not hide the 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 wrong choices of some people there. David, we know what he did, but he was a victor in Jesus Christ. Rahab was an international prostitute, but because she accepted by faith what was promised, she became one of the great grandmothers of Jesus Christ. If there was hope for her, there's hope for me in this battle. I hope the sound will work well. The technician, I, they are there. I want you to please keep, keep silent and focus on what will be. Okay, can you call Orville? I need some sound, please. I'm sorry. It is a story of a marathon runner from Tanzania that competed at the Mexico Olympics. There were 75 runners, some abandoned. He kept on running. He was the last to arrive. He was 57. His story is the source of encouragement. The pictures are not good because remember, it was filmed in 1968. I don't know where you were, so you understand. I need some sound, please. At the 1968 Mexico City Marathon, three men earned the right to stand on the victory platform. 
the winners of the gold, silver, and bronze Olympic medals. But for some, the reward is a personal one, the knowledge that they finished what they set out to do. A little over an hour after the winner of the marathon crossed the finish line, John Stephen Aquari of Tanzania approaches the stadium, the last man to complete the journey. A voice calls from within to go on, and so he goes on. Afterwards, it was written, Today we have seen a young African runner who symbolizes the finest in the human spirit, a performance that gives true dignity to sport, a performance that lifts sport out of the category of grown men playing at games, a performance that gives meaning to the word courage. Perhaps the words of John Stephen Aquari epitomize all that is right in the human spirit. When asked why he did not quit, he said simply, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. The light in this Tanzanian runner is a beacon to us all, to endure to the end, to finish the race, however long and hard the road. The winner, the winner did not even get that one. They interviewed him. Why did you not quit? He said that my country has not sent me here 5,000 miles away to quit the race. My country has sent me to finish the race. Let me put it here in perspective. Jesus did not come from heaven to die for us for us to quit the race. Jesus came to die for us to finish the race. I don't know what you are going through. Maybe you are wounded. Maybe someone has wounded you or you've wounded yourself or the devil has wounded you. That is not a reason for you to quit. Because Jesus, no matter happened to you, remember, Jesus did not die for you to quit the race. Jesus died for you to finish the race. S several times I felt like quitting the race. In ministry, I cannot tell you how many times I attempted to resign. But I would have been a loser if I had allowed the devil or someone to lead me to resignation. When we came here, it was so, so hard the devil was telling us, where are your prayers? You prayed and you believed that God was sending you to Andrews University. Why is God not paying your rent? One day my wife and I packed up and we wanted to leave. It would have been a mistake. The devil would have been the winner. But I want Jesus to always be the winner in my life. You know, the other part of the good news is this one. We are very fortunate. And I love. You are fortunate. I am fortunate. Do you know why? We know the end of the battle. <laughs> we know the end of 
the battle. We know how it will end. Jesus is the victor. When I was 11, I one day picked the wrong fight. I picked a fight with someone that was stronger than me. When we came face to face, after the first blows, I realized that I would not be the winner here. I told him, I said, guys, wait. <laughs> he waited. I said, I'm going to call my brother. He said, go and call your brother. I ran home about two miles. My brothers were not home except one, the youngest, the one I was following. I said, hey, I picked the fight there by Ross on me. Can you come? He came. We ran there. When they locked the fight, he and my brother, within 50, 30 seconds, I saw my brother on the ground being punched. I ran away. <laughs> but you know what? Jesus can never be defeated. By being on his side, you are a winner. He said, I want to share my victory with you, but I want you to come to me. That's why he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all those who are heavy laden, burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest means here is victory in this battle between good and evil. I will give you rest. Don't listen to people. Forget about them. Sometimes they are rotten inside out. That is why they want you to be rotten also. Don't listen to them, but only listen to Jesus' invitation. You know what? I've discovered that real significance is not in degrees. Real significance is not in position. Real significance is not in our beauty because one day that beauty will fade away. Real significance is only found in the new life that Jesus offers us. My invitation to you this morning is simple. It's a question. Why not decide to journey alongside the winner? Is it your decision? That's what I have decided. I fall, but the most important thing is not when I fall. The most important thing is that Christ is always there to give me a hand to help me stand up and continue my race. I have decided and I've renewed my decision this morning to journey on alongside Jesus the winner. If that is your will, I'll only please with you, plead with you to stand and I'll ask our church pastor to come and lead us in the prayer of, uh, of commitment. The struggle continues in my life, maybe in your life, but one thing is certain. That certainty is victory. If you've been blessed, would you say amen? amen? Amen. The assurance is always that the victory is certain in Jesus Christ. I want to thank uh, Dr. Babaker for uh, just the assurance we have that there is no hill too steep for us to climb, no battles too strong that we cannot enter and win, no race too long that we cannot persevere and be a victor. And even in our Christian walk, the assurance is ours that through Christ, we are strengthened to be the victors. And so as we commit in prayer, as we commit in prayer, my hope for you, my hope for myself, my hope for all of us is that we would hold on to Jesus Christ. We would do what? Hold on to Jesus Christ. And we will never let go until he comes. Just hold somebody's hand next to you right now. Hold somebody's hand as we pray, as if we're holding to the hand of God. Father, as we join hands together, we make a commitment to you today that by your grace, in your strength, by your power, our desire is never to let go. And so we ask, Lord, 
that as we go through this race of life, as we follow this journey, we will not be detracted by the things of this world, but we would, we would be attracted to you. We would be attracted to Jesus Christ. And we would persevere. We would run the race with patience, looking to God who is before us, that we would be faithful, holding on until victory in Jesus is announced. We ask your blessing, Lord, as we make this commitment today, that when we leave here, we would be victorious. When we leave here, we would be faithful. When we leave here, we would stand firm in Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, when you come and all the saints go marching in, oh, Lord, we want to be amongst that number. We want to be with that group. We want to be with all nations when the saints go marching in. Help us to be faithful until then. Help us to be true until then. Help us to keep running the race with patience until then. We pray in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen and amen. God bless you. Amen.